Who doesn't love a good old 3D movie? Let's all go to the lobby. But do you know what I hate? Is when producers make me wear silly props that make me look like an idiot. But you know who doesn't look stupid in 3D glasses are these tiny praying mantises. For the past six years, researchers at Newcastle University have been strapping tiny 3D glasses onto these little critters to study how their 3D vision might work and how they might apply those findings to robots. I'm Jenny Reed. I'm Professor of Vision Science at the Institute of Neuroscience, Newcastle University, UK. To learn more, we caught up with Jenny Reed, who's leading this research. Tell us about this system that you are studying. So I'm studying praying mantises and in particular how they do 3D or stereoscopic vision. So you use the different views that your two eyes see to work out how far away things are. And that's an ability that was only discovered in humans in the 19th century and used to be thought, you know, really complicated and only higher mammals like humans and monkeys and maybe cats can do. But back in the 1980s, it was discovered that actually insects have this ability as well, or at least one insect, the praying mantis. So when I heard about that, I got really interested and thought, we need to find out how that works. How is these tiny insect brains achieving stereoscopic vision? Are they doing it in the same way as we do? Which would be really interesting, because I think then that would tell us that there's only one good way of doing stereo vision. But the other possibility is that maybe insects have evolved a completely separate way of doing stereo vision. In that case, that would also be really fascinating to find out how they've done it and maybe get new ideas for how you can achieve stereoscopic vision in machines. So this is one of my favorite methodologies of all time. Can you talk about how you went about studying this system, uh, how you went about attaching 3D glasses to mantises? So that was the first puzzle that we had to solve when we were beginning this study. So I mentioned the uh, initial research in the 1980s on insect 3D vision. That used prisms, and it's a really beautiful and clever technique. And because prisms bend the light rays, that has the effect of basically stereoscopically moving everything either closer or further away. But we couldn't use that for the experiments I wanted to do, because in order to answer these questions, we needed to present much more complicated 3D images to it. So I needed to find some way of presenting 3D images just like we do for humans. So we spend a lot of time trying various techniques, but in the end, the, the only one that's actually worked for us is using coloured filters. You might be familiar with these red-blue 3D glasses that, I don't know, used to get in cereal packets when I was a kid and in, in the 3D movies back in the 50s. That technology has kind of been superseded for humans, but for the insects, it still works really well. The only thing is we didn't want to use red light uh, because insects... Most of them, including mantids, don't see red light at all. It's just not a wavelength that they're sensitive to. So we shifted everything towards shorter wavelengths and we used blue and green light. So the idea is we have a computer monitor and we display the left image, say, on the blue channel and the right image on the green channel. And then with these coloured filters, we ensure that each eye of the insect sees only the appropriate channel. And that's work done by my very talented postdoc, Vivek Nichananda, and he spent so much time figuring out how to achieve this and ironing out all the problems that we encountered along the way. And of course, as you say, the big problem was how do you attach glasses to an insect, right? There are many ears that you could put glasses on with. And so Vivek came up with a a harmless form of glue made out of beeswax and resin, so natural ingredients that aren't going to harm the animal. And with a wax melter, he just melts a little dob of beeswax, places it on the mantis's forehead, and then with tiny 3D glasses that he's cut out previously, he holds them with tweezers and just pops them in place. The beeswax dries within seconds, and then the glasses are held in place in front of the mantis's eyes. And you might think they would be bothered by that, but actually they seem really indifferent to it. So can you elaborate a bit on what kinds of images you're showing to these mantises um, and then what you are learning from how they're reacting to such images? So here I'd like to um, distinguish between basically three prongs of our research. We're pursuing behavioral, electrophysiological and computational strands of the research. So the behavior was trying to figure out, okay, what can their stereo vision do? How do we break it? What kind of images does it work with? What kind of images does it not work with? 
And this is something you know, vision scientists do all the time, and it helps us figure out basically the algorithms that the brain is using in order to achieve 3D vision. And that's where the computational part comes in. And the thing is for the behavioral experiments, we're basically relying on the animals to tell us what they can see. So they're experiencing a 3D illusion in our experiments if they reach out and catch or try and catch the virtual object. So the trouble is that limits us because whatever we display has to be attractive enough to elicit a strike. If the animal sees something in 3D but isn't interested, it'll just sit there. And then of course we don't know, is it seeing anything? Is it not seeing anything? So Vivek's first job was to try and figure out a really attractive stimulus that would drive the behavior really well. And what we've come up with was a black disc that just spirals around the computer screen, getting in, in ever decreasing circles, and it comes to rest just in front of the mantis. And that really seems to get them going. So that was our first stimulus that we used to basically prove that the glasses were working. And having established that, then we could use more complicated images. So we've been using uh, images made up of black and white patterns of dots. And the reason for this is we want to then manipulate things like the correlation of the pattern between the two eyes. So basically, human stereo vision works by cross-correlating the two eyes' images. So as it were, your brain is kind of sliding across the images and going, ah, yeah, that is the best match where the correlation is highest. And so that was my starting point for mantis stereo vision. So with these random dot patterns, we manipulated the correlation between the left and right eye images. And we know in humans that totally messes with your 3D vision. But to our great surprise, this just didn't bother the mantis at all. They were able to carry on striking and grabbing the virtual prey, even when there was no correlation at all between the pattern of light and dark in the two eyes images. So you might say, well, if there wasn't any correlation, how could you define where the prey was? And the answer is it's the relation of where things are changing in the image. So it's a stereo vision that's based entirely on motion or at least on change. And it actually, as far as we know, doesn't work at all with static images. So it's really completely different in that sense from our own human stereo vision. What were you doing to kind of look inside the brains to determine what is going on um, in the neurobiology here when they are looking at these images? My other extremely talented postdoc, Ronnie Rosner, has been looking at that. And that's been a real technical challenge because even though he's extremely experienced in insect neurophysiology, people don't tend to work with praying mantises. So he had to figure out how to get into their brains, how to record activity from individual ne neurons, nerve cells inside their brain. And he had to, to do this while they were watching these 3D displays. Ronnie's found neurons in the mantis brain which are tuned to positions in 3D space. So a neuron that might like objects here or a neuron that might like objects over here. And by like, I mean it's firing more spikes of voltage. And that seems to be telling the animal where things are in the space around it. So putting that all together, um, how would a system like that that's going on in the, the mantis insect brain differ from how we humans perceive 3D objects? So we're still trying to work out the details of that, but the kind of preliminary model I have in my mind at the moment, which we're trying to write computer programs to instantiate and test, is that actually the take home for me is it's much more similar to humans at the neural level than I had expected. We thought originally that mantis stereopsis might be super simple, like maybe you have inputs in the left eye, inputs in the right eye, and they're combined very late, so that you basically have an AND gate just before you decide whether to strike. And if you see something in the left eye and the right eye, bingo, you strike. But actually, Ron is finding many classes of neurons that are tuned to stereoscopic distance uh, at all levels of the brain, and he's found feedback loops. Um, so that's suggesting quite a complicated circuit. So I think it's been surprising how similar uh, the neural basis of 3D vision seems to be in the insect compared to the mammal. But I think the difference is maybe at the front end. So whereas these computations in humans are being done on the pattern of light and dark in the two eyes, in the mantis they seem to be done on the pattern of change, so where things are changing. So I personally believe that this research can stand perfectly fine on its own. It's, it's great, these are awesome findings, but um, there's a bigger picture here, I think, with applications toward robotics in particular. Can you elaborate how you might take what you've learned with this study and then apply them to 
machines that are moving around in the real world. So I'm, I'm very interested in this because I tend to think of insects as kind of tiny, amazingly efficient robots. And so, of course, it's hugely interesting to think how could we take what we learn from insects and, and put it into robotics. I take two main lessons from what we've learned so far about mantis stereopsis. I think working with change is a really interesting idea and not something that's been used a lot in the machine stereo literature so far. And the fact that it works so successfully for mantids suggests to me that it might be worth taking seriously for some robotic applications. Again, you'd have to think carefully about the applications, but you know, maybe if you have a drone that is moving and wants to come and pick something up, um, just like a mantis catching a prey that is a particular distance, maybe it would work uh, for that kind of application. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks very much.